when I applied for physiotherapy, or at the time that I was leaving school, school leavers could virtually choose whatever career they wanted. There was such a, a shortage of, of everything. And so, not knowing what to do, I applied for a whole lot of things, like nursing in about three different hospitals in the South Island, physiotherapy, pharmacy, school teaching, and they all accepted me, not necessarily at the dates that I wanted, but some, except for physiotherapy. And that was a bit interesting because when I had my interviews, I was interviewed by Joan McGrath, who was the Registrar of the Physio Board and Inspector of Physiotherapy for the Health Department at that time, because I was also applying for a, a health department bursary. She rubbished me at my interview. She told me I had flat feet and that I wouldn't last the distance in the wards. My medical certificate showed I had hay fever and I would be hopeless with the, with the dust from the hospital blankets and the talcum powder from the massage. And it really wasn't a suitable job for me at all. Also, she noted that I had only just turned my turn 17 and the prospectus clearly stated 18 to 35 was the age for admission. And so I was declined. They did tell me that they would put my name on a supplementary waiting list, but even Ms. Scott even told me at interview I was far too young, go back to school. And I just told her there was no way I was going back to school and if she didn't want me, I would, somebody else I'm sure would. So I went back to Invercargill and was working two holiday jobs at that stage with the view of going nursing in the following June, which was the first intake I could get into. And one week exactly before the course started, and physio course started in Dunedin, I got a telegram from the physio school offering me a place in the school. Well, I have to say the jobs I was doing, one was on a, a manual telephone exchange saying, number please, you're through, number please, engaged, it was pretty boring. My other job was at the swimming pool, taking ticket sales and uh, blowing the whistle or ringing the bell at the end of a swimming session. So anything to get me out of Invercargill and doing anything had to be better. So I jumped at the place to go to physio school. I think one of the things that had influenced me in choosing physiotherapy as one of the things I might like to do was that during my high school time I had been a very keen swimmer and the school looked called for volunteers to assist the, with the Crippled Children's Society swimming session once a week. And I volunteered for that, in fact did it for three years, taking uh, a lot of them with cerebral palsy children, in hindsight, um, in the water and trying to teach them to swim, but just getting them to relax and enjoy it. And they did, they loved it. And I think that was really my first introduction, quite unwittingly, of hydrotherapy. So, back to physio school, I went with one week's notice. Uh, fortunately, I had an aunt in Dunedin whom I could board with, and we were very busy into class straight away. And at the time that I trained, there was a very formidable exam at the six months point at August, when we knew that about 10 or 12 of the class would be failed, and that they would be out for the rest of that year and they would come back the next year if they wanted to. We were allowed to repeat the first year a second time. And we were an intake of 65 students which was quite big and we had various different uniforms that we had to dress for for, for spe specific classes. Uh, as first years we wore a fawn starched uniform with a very heavily waxed belt from the Chinaman. Um, we wore civvies for the external lecturers for the 8 o'clock anatomy and physiology lectures, but then we were into our foreign uniforms 
or if it was SRE, Swedish Remedial Exercises, it was black gym frocks, white shirts, black ties, black long stockings, and would you believe, white sand shirts. Then we had gymnastics, uh, where we had black rompers. We didn't wear the gym frocks for that. We wore black rompers and our white shirts. And I think that was mainly to keep us fit. But we had to do some pretty ridiculous things on the balance beam. And starting off doing handstands in groups of four with a hoop. One person to hold the hoop and two to hold a leg each. And then we were supposed to next week to be able to graduate to handstands in three handstands and twos and then do a freestanding handstand. I don't think I ever even mastered the handstand with four. So I was a bit of a disaster in that department. However, our big exams came in August and I was one of the lucky ones and passed. There were about 12 or 15 of my colleagues who failed and some we didn't ever see again, which was very sad. In that intake first year, first year students, we had a number of Colombo Plan students. From memory, I think there were about seven or eight. Uh, there were two boys, both from what was then known as Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and Nalathambi and Weeratni both failed their first year, which was very sad because they, I think it was a language barrier for them. Their English was just not as good as uh, the other Colombo Plan students who were predominantly from Malaysia and Hong Kong. Um, the girls certainly all passed, finished their exams. When we resumed in September, we went straight on to clinical work, a half day in the wards or the departments, wherever the roster took us, and a half day of lectures. So really, it was really a very short period of intense lectures only, but they were 8 to 5, Monday to Friday, and we used to have to go back down to the school in Hanover Street on Saturday mornings to clean the department and especially clean the wax room and the dreadful business of straining the paraffin wax and leaving the stainless steel gleaming and washing all the lint pads that were used for the galvanism treatments and things like that that were that really were some very rigorous discipline uh, meted out to us, which I suppose was good for later life. So we treated patients half days, and then uh, when we came back the second years, we graduated to white uniforms with the traditional physio blue epaulettes. And again, we were half-day lectures and half-day practical clinical for, for the whole of that year. In my third year, we were all sent from Dunedin to subsidiary training schools, and I went with, I think, seven others to Palmerston North Hospital, and we had a tutor there with one lecture a day, an hour in the morning, and then we were treating patients for the rest of that of the day, five days a week. Once a week, we did a, an assignment weekly assignment or sort of a mini exam and all the papers were sent back to Dunedin for marking. In the September we left our distal placements and all returned back to Dunedin which was a little bit difficult because we then had to find accommodation for an intensive eight week period prior to our exams. Uh, some of it was clinical but there were, there were a lot of lectures that had to be done in that time. When we were in our third year, which was 1961, uh, there was a big polio epidemic and three of my classmates who were students in Auckland all contracted polio. There were three or four girls and all flatting together. And those three girls, they were very lucky. They weren't too badly affected, but because of the illness they did lose some of their clinical hours and all had to make up extra time after graduation to get sufficient clinical hours to get their registration. Also in that third year when I was in Palmerston North we saw a lot of cases, well, 
by a lot, probably seven or eight cases of tetanus. And these really were treated very intensively by physiotherapy in those days. They were on respirators. It was before there was any tetanus vaccination or any good anti-tetanus um, serum. So in those days it tended not to be called tetanus quite so much. It was known as lockjaw. And these patients would be, as I say, on the respirator, but the physio department or staff were, were rostered and would do four-hour stints with the patient in intensive care, just monitoring their breathing and monitoring their chest and making sure it was not building up fluid and putting the, the limbs through passive movements. And we never knew what the outcome would be some patients died, some survived. It was it was a strange way that lockjaw, as it was known, was managed in those days, but it was the best available. But it was certainly an experience that you don't see happen anywhere these days. The examination process was a little bit difficult. Well, it was spread out. We, As I mentioned, we had those big exams in our first year, Second year we set our anatomy exam and our physics exam. I had the misfortune to fail my physics exam at the end of second year, which was a bit tough because I'd spent most of the time coaching most of my flatmates. However, I sat it again the third year and would you believe it, I failed it again too. And this was caused a problem because it meant I couldn't graduate technically with the rest of my cohorts at the November graduation. I had to do some extra time and sit the physics paper yet again, which I did in the following March. So I didn't graduate until March 62 when my classmates finished in November 61. When the results came up on the notice board of those final exams, uh, there was supposed to be most a lot of celebration. It was all done coded. We all had numbers. And if your number wasn't on the board, you were expected to burst into tears and just vanish. And However, I knew the physics marks came out before these other big ones, so I knew I was already doomed to sit specials. And then it was a question of, well, how many more exams are you going to sit again? And however, fortunately, it was only the physics and traditionally, those who had failed that last lot of exams did not go to graduation. But I was asked to go to graduation, and I had no reason. I didn't think about it. I thought it was all a bit of a laugh, really. I wasn't too perturbed. Certainly didn't shed any tears over it. And so my father came up to collect me, to take me back to Invercargill after the graduation, and I sat there and watched, clapped, watched all the, my friends go up and get their certificates. And when it came to the special prizes, much to my absolute amazement, my name was called out and I had won the maternity prize. And uh, so I, of course, there was tremendous cheering and hooping from my classmates because I wasn't going away empty-handed after all. But however, I still had to come back, but I was given a week's holiday. And I rather, it was a bit sad I didn't finish that on that day, because that day of our graduation was actually the day before uh, my 20th birthday. I would have actually graduated at 19. I guess it's just as well I didn't. <laughs> um, my father took me home, and as was the custom, 21 was the drinking limit age for drinking in those days and it was six o'clock closing too. I had learnt how to deal with that when I had been flatting in Dunedin like most students. As was traditional driving between Invercargill and Dunedin in those days my father stopped at the Waiholder pub to go in and have his five ounces of beer. This was long before breath testing or anything like that was suggested. And because I was still under 21, tradition still played a part. He brought me out a tray to the car with a raspberry and lemonade on it. My father, despite the fact he knew that I 
had been a drinker in Dunedin as a student, was still not prepared to bend the rules and shout me a, a five ounce beer. I had my raspberry and lemonade drink, that was for me, in the car. You don't go into a hotel till you're 21. I could tell him some stories about being caught after a house and underage in some of the hotels in Dunedin and Queenstown, but I didn't ever tell him those stories. He wouldn't have liked them. <laughs>